Okay, uh, welcome back. Let's look at chapter one. What I'm going to do is really just go through chapter one page by page, um, and you know, just so we understand um, uh, the notes and you know all the information that's provided for us. Um, okay, so chapter one is titled "Holy God: The Revelation of a Holy God." Psalm ninety-nine, verse five and nine. It says, "Exalt the Lord our God." and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. You notice anywhere where his presence is, or anything that is set apart unto him, is titled holy. Holy hill, how, how you know, <clears throat> What's that one in Andhra? Hill. There's a. Uh, there's some. Uh, Tirupati. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Uh, so certain people, it, it's considered like a holy hill, isn't it? They want to climb and whatnot. So, and why? Because they consider that something divine is dwelling there. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, the hill is holy. Why? Because he resides there. Our God resides there. And uh, you know, in, in the tabernacle of Moses, every vessel uh, and everything that the priest wore had this thing called, and they had this inscription, "Holy unto the Lord." Holy unto the Lord. A cup, the lampstand, <laughs> the table, right, the belt. Now, everything had this inscription that said, "Holy unto the Lord." That means what was set apart for God cannot be used for anything else. So if you are set apart for God, that means you are not available for anything else of the world or the flesh. Okay, why? Because he is holy and you are his. Are you with me? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> there are various facets to the nature of God. God is love. We feel love. God is good. We believe in his goodness towards us. And we walk in goodness towards others, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> God is almighty, all powerful. That is, He is omniscient. Right? God is almighty and all powerful. We trust in His power. God is wise, all knowing. So we lean on His instruction and follow Him. Like we looked at the verse in Proverbs chapter 3, right? And God is our healer, our Jehovah Rapha. We trust Him to heal us. Um, and there are so many facets like that. And and God is holy. God is holy. So we must have this desire to know him, pursue him. And who is this God? Uh, Psalm 24 says, um, "Open your, uh, lift up your uh, heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. Let the king of glory come in. Who is this king of glory so strong and mighty? He is the king of glory. And with those words, when you read those Psalms, those scriptures, it should do something to us. It should mean something. Who is this king of glory so strong and mighty? Who is this king of glory? Right? You know, it, it's like a it's a question with with I want to know. Hey, who is this guy? I want to meet him. You know, you speak so much about this person, you know. Like, hey, you got to meet this person. You have to meet this person. You talk about a person so much, it creates this, this a good interest in you. It's like, who is this guy? I want to meet him. It's like that kind of a question. Who is this king of glory, so strong and mighty? Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. Let the king of glory come in. Right, And so we must, we must have this burning desire to know him. Like... A desire that is not easily quenched or you know or satisfied. Like day and night, day and night. Psalm one says, meditate on his word day and night. That means every day. It doesn't say only one day, Tuesday, when you know, it says day meditate on his word day and night. It doesn't say which day. Right? Meditate on his word. And who is the word? Yes. Right? That 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 love for him that hunger for him, that desire for him. 
and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be in. Like, um, you know, have you seen uh, if you you know your parents or your, any of your friends or relatives, uh, you know, who've been in who a prayerful person, you know, who've consistently who consistently prays, and they will always be in a posture, you know, they would kneel down and and my grandmother was one of them and i've seen i uh, have a few friends you know that posture of humility and just say lord i love you i want to spend this time with you i want more of you and just by looking at that person who is this god that she is worshiping i want to know this jesus right and so the hunger for god in you can birth and hunger for God and someone else, All right? So your desire should be so contagious. That's why I use the word that you need to burn because you've seen forest fire, you know, that fire travels at quite a speed, like 27 kilometers per hour. That's fast for a fire, okay? Uh, and it also depends. <laughs> but your, your burning desire should be so contagious that people around you should catch fire for him. Are you with me, right? And so he is holy, and you need, like, who is this God? I want to know him. It's, I'm not, and and it's, I'm not just talking in an intellectual or a theological capacity, right? It's not just an intellectual understanding or a theological or academic pursuit. Um, there's something much more deeper. Ephesians one verse seventeen. It's in the notes at the bottom uh, of your page, I think. Um, page eight. Okay, it's all the same. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared to mention the page numbers because I don't know which page number you will have. So, Ephesians one verse seventeen. It says, "And that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowledge of Him." It is the Holy Spirit who reveals the Father to us. Right now, yes, all of this is good. We are academically, we are pursuing, we are trying to understand His holiness. And it's important, right? Intellectually, theologically, we are trying to understand. All of that is good, but the only other person who can reveal the fullness of who He, uh, you know, our Lord and Savior Jesus, is the Holy Spirit. In uh, Isaiah 11, uh, I think verse two onwards, it says, "He is the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of wisdom. He is the Spirit of revelation." Uh, you know, the seven spirits are mentioned there. And so he is the spirit of wisdom. Isaiah 11, verse 2. Um, right? And revelation in the knowledge of him. The spirit of the living God. What's his first name? Holy. <laughs> Right, uh, he is holy. The Bible says that he searches the deeper things of God to bring into life for us. Okay, so first, the revelation of his nature comes to our hearts, then there is a response from us towards his nature, who God is. Okay, so let's just look at that first. The revelation of his nature comes to our hearts. Revelation means what? Revealing, unveiling. Right, if you have a dupatta around your face, that means you are covered. You There's a veil around you. So as you remove the cloth of your face, what is happening? You're unveiling, right? So there is the revelation of his nature. That means there's an unveiling. Right? There's an unveiling that's coming to our hearts first. And after that unveiling, there is a response. It's, we are still in this Isaiah story a little bit, right? So... Isaiah has this unveiling, and then there is a response from um, towards the nature of God. When then uh, we then discover that He invites us to have His nature reproduced in us and revealed through us, He invites us to be like Him. So with our encounter with the Lord of His holiness is not an encounter for the sake of an encounter. So that you can write in your book and tell the friends, it's like, oh, you know, I had this encounter, you had a... <laughs> you know, so the thing, the result is always this. Isaiah's encounter with the Lord of his holiness 
That's one thing. And Isaiah responds to that. Woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And then he gets cleansed. But his assignment came much later. God, okay, who shall go for me? What does Isaiah say? I will go. You know, here I am. You know, here am I, KJV. <laughs> here am I. Send me. So it's such, such a beautiful process, right? The correct revelation of his nature will ev evoke the right response from us toward God and draw us to the place where his nature is reproduced in us and revealed through us. And that's the whole point of this, is that our encounter with the Lord and His holiness, if it's not reproduced and reflected in and through us, um, then we need to answer some questions. <laughs> okay, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Are you, are you all with me, by the way? All okay, no? Okay. Okay. Um, I hope everybody online is also all okay. Um, okay, great. Thank you. I have not forgotten thee, for I have not I have not carved you. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord, it simply means the intimacy with the Lord. That's what it is. It's not like, oh my gosh, fear him. You know, it's knowing him, to know him. Right? It's in a very intimate language there. It, uh, it's a similar word. It says when you read uh, in Matthew and in Luke, uh, it says when um, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, it says for the time that she carried, Joseph did not know her. That means he did not have any physical um, uh, connection or contact with Mary. That's what it is. He did not know her. That means it's an intimate language there. Okay, so it says the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Is That means to knowing him, who he is. He is the spirit of wisdom. Obviously, that's the beginning of wisdom, right? And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Right? To know him in his holiness, to have a revelation of holiness is really the fear of the Lord. Just to know him. Okay, um, and a couple of pages points from there on. We again, it's, talk, it's talking about Isaiah chapter six, verse one to eight in those notes, um, which we've already spoken in the last class. Okay, so uh, just before the scripture Isaiah six, above that it talks about um, what is an idol, right? Anything that takes place of God is an idol. Any that misrepresents God <laughs> is an idol. Sometimes our theology misrepresents God to us and creates idols in our minds, ideas, notions, and pictures of God that are actually unlike Him. We can spend a whole semester talking about all that, right? Right? For so many years, this is how I worshipped. Why should I change? Okay? <laughs> Hence, it is important to have a correct revelation of God and hold every facet of His nature and character together. Okay. All right. Uh, and guys, I believe that our first encounter begins with the Word of God. As in, there will be other encounters, I'm sure. But then His revelation, His revealed. This is the revealed, you know, written Word of God. Right. <clears throat> okay. So uh, we studied a little bit about His uh, Isaiah's encounter with, with God and. Um, what happens after that? So let's move on to the bot bottom of page 10. His nature reproduced in us. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16 it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, which word stands out to you in that verse? Which word? Okay. 
Okay. Thanks, Anand. Yeah. So that's verse 13. Let's read verse 14, 15, and 16 as well. Okay. So, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 19.2 Speak to all the congregation of children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. All right. This section is again titled, His Nature Reproduced in Us. Okay. Verse 13 starts off by saying, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober now be sober when do we use that word sober when we are not under the influence of another substance basically okay um so a drug addict or an alcoholic uh, will will be asked this question or will say i have been sober for two years now that means for two years i have not had taken any drugs or had any alcohol right it with me, right? So that's a word that is used to say that I am not, I have not been under the influence of another substance or an external substance. So here it's saying, okay, be sober. Uh, sure, Pastor, one hundred percent. I don't do any drugs, you know. <laughs> anyway, but uh, are there other things in the in the world that uh, influences us? Obviously, right? Of course. Um, Paul writes in Ephesians, Ephesians 5.18, he says, um, don't be drunk in wine. That's a commandment. Okay? Do not be drunk in wine. We take that first half very seriously, right? Yeah, it's like, yes, Lord, you know, I'll write and give, you know, no wine, even during Christmas, no wine, for sure, you know. <laughs> uh, do not be drunk in wine. What is he saying? Don't be under the influence of something. But the second half of the command is often forgotten. But be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Um, so there's a little bit of water in this flask right now. There's about this much here. Here. Uh, is this full? No. So what if the water was up to here? Is it full? No. Till here? Is, is it full? Filled to the brim. Is it full? Not okay, that's right. Even if it's up to here to, to the brim, it's not full. The only way to measure fullness is when it's overflowing, right? Only when it's overflowing. So, you're saying be filled with the spirit, that means you're saying your life needs to overflow. It's as simple as that, right? When we say in the script, we saw in Isaiah chapter 6, the train of his rope filled the temple, it's again. Is saying that there was an abundance of his presence. It was an overflow, right? There was no end. Okay, so uh, be sober. Don't be influenced by uh, anything else. Um, be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus chapter 19 is actually a very important chapter. Um, there's a very famous verse in that chapter that is uh, used for preaching about tattoos. Uh, and the rest of the chapter is left out. <laughs> Only that verse is taken. <laughs> it's okay if you don't understand the rest of the chapter, guys. But this verse says, "Thou shalt not have any." Yeah, yeah. So, so. <clears throat> Anyways, by the way, I don't have any tattoos. Okay, I'm just saying. So, <laughs> <clears throat> just because the thing is, I don't know what which one to get. So. <laughs> I, I don't want to regret later and then and then when I get old I don't want my skin to be hanging and with the tattoo looking there so it's like, you know so. anyways right God desires for his nature to be reproduced in us and revealed through us we looked at into that section right <clears throat> so uh, holiness what is this Holiness is absolute 
sinless. Okay. So uh, very quickly, can someone uh, look for uh, the dictionary defin definition of what absolute is and uh, put it on the chat section, if you will, please? Put it on the chat. Absolute, just absolute. Anything else? Any other definitions? Please feel free to share it. OK, so <clears throat> I'm sure you've used these words. You are absolutely right. What does that mean? You are absolutely wrong <laughs> to the lies it fully. Yeah. Would, would you say a, a murderer is wrong or absolutely wrong or partially wrong? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Hey, thank you for. It, uh, so we we don't look at a murderer or a rapist or a, a pedophile, uh, serial murderer. You know, we don't just say they are wrong. We, when we use the why, when, when do we use the word absolutely wrong? Is that means there is no turning back? It's like there is that's the utmost degree to which you can kind of uh, in all totality, right? Um, so that's the understanding. It is holiness is absolute sinlessness because anything that is sin cannot be part of holiness. Okay. Holiness is absolute purity. Okay, how many of us here can say I'm absolutely pure? <laughs> Because anything impure or unclean uh, cannot be part of holiness. His absolute truth, because anything that is untruth or a lie cannot be part of holiness. His absolute holiness is absolute faithfulness, because anything that violates covenant cannot be part of holiness. Holiness is absolute justice or righteous, because injustice cannot be part of holiness. Holiness is absolute love. Because anything of hate contradicts holiness. Love does not rejoice in sin. There is a uh, there is an appetite and a level of hatred that we need to develop towards sin. Right? Um, you need to hate sin. Only then you can love him. Right? It, it won't me for I'm a man of unclean lips. Uh, you need to know where you're at. Okay, let's move on. Holiness is absolute goodness because anything unkind cannot be part of holiness. Holiness is absolutely sacred because anything profane cannot be part of holiness. Holiness is absolute perfection. Holiness is God-likeness. This is God. He is holy. He is absolute in all of the facets that we just saw. He is absolute. In everything that we just read. He is holy. This is his nature. It is his person. That he is holy. We have to say it many times in a day. Lord, you are holy. You are holy. You are holy. God, you are holy. And maybe a hundredth time it might hit us. Like, oh, <laughs> you know. One of my favorite uh, uh, experiences um, while leading worship in 2011, we had a, a worship thing that was going day and night for seven days. And um, I'm sharing this not because I was leading worship, but then there was something beautiful that was happening in the room. And this was. 1 a.m. in the night. So this is 24 hours, right? So 1 a.m. So I remember the time because I was on the. It was just me on the keyboards, and um, 
and there was a song again the chorus was uh, holy 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 there is no one like you uh, I actually even forget the song now hmm in the presence of angels is the name of the song that much i know in the presence of angels uh, but so as we were singing the song uh, we were just declaring holy 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 and there came a time where i just didn't feel, uh, stop playing and uh, we just sang that chorus for 3 hours <laughs> And just people, just their voices. Uh, I was, I didn't have to lead after a point. Um, it's one of my favorite memories, I should say. Yeah. Um, but there's something about his holy presence, standing in his presence, standing with the people and singing the same thing with who all of us are having the same glimpse. And that was just three hours. I mean, we, we will be singing for eternity. <laughs> Right. Uh, so holiness is the very nature of God. I am in now in page 12. Um, holiness is the very nature of God. God is holy. Holiness is the very core of God's nature. The holiness of created things. Holiness with God is his nature. Holiness outside of God is a quality and a state that is bestowed. We are holy because he calls us holy and makes us holy. When God calls us to be holy, what he is asking us to be, set apart to him, the one who is holy. So if it was impossible, God wouldn't have commanded. He wouldn't said, be holy for I am holy. He's, the very reason that he has given us the commandment is that he knows that He is there to empower us to live a holy life. Are you with me, right? You know, there was a there was a time I struggled with addictions, teenagers, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, and I'd be drinking, smoking, you know. That's the usual teenager stuff, I guess, back then. <laughs> um, but I did not like it. It's not that I was enjoying the addiction. And uh, and I have tried, I tried a lot of things to get out of it. That is step one, do this, step two, step three. Five steps to recovery, five steps to restoration. You know, seven steps, let's make it biblical. Seven steps uh, to, uh, seven steps to uh, be free out of this. Um, I'm sure it works for people, right? It didn't work for me. Um, see, striving for living a holy life is not just uh, looking at, say, an act of sin, for example, sin, uh, lying. Okay, you look at lying and say, like, oh, lying, lying, lying. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I shouldn't do it. Striving for being holy is you don't look at the sin that. That's that wants to pull you down and be scared, but instead it's the opposite. You have just got to fix your eyes on the one who is holy. It is His beauty that sets that set me free. It is who He is that set me free. Are you with me? Right. I, you know, I would okay from from you know, for example, I'm I'm not sure how many of you can relate with me. Okay, from this week, I'm going to stop doing this. So one month, ah, oh, one month, huh? Yeah, one month. Okay, the next month gone, back to square one, and going back to the square one will be so emotionally draining. Like, uh, and then that will hurt your identity, and that you will look yourself in the mirror and say, "What a mess are you? You're absolutely worthless, Roshan. Why do you want to lead worship? How can you lead worship? Right? In your own efforts, and uh, let me say this, and let me be emphatically very clear: in your own efforts, you can only try so much. But it is us beholding him that sets us free. 
Are you with me? It's also the same thing with hunger for God. In my flesh, because the flesh absolutely hates God. It's fallen. It's sinful in nature, isn't it? In my flesh, I can only want so much of Him. Only He can birth a hunger in me to hunger for more of Him. Only He can put a desire in me to desire for more of Him. Right? And then you come to that place and say, Lord, I desire for more of you. Holy Spirit, birth in me a hunger and a desire like only you can do. And that is birthed in your spirit. Because your spirit man connects to the spirit of God. He is spirit, isn't it? Okay. All right. So holy uh, Hebrew for holy, adjective, kadosh. We saw that holy, pure. Uh, from its usage, we derive the meaning of being devoted, dedicated, sanctified for a particular purpose. Holy, set apart. Greek for holy in the in the Greek, the word hagios meaning holy and its derivatives, hagiosmos, translated holiness, correspond to the Hebrew kadosh. Believers are called hagioi, saints, sanctified, <clears throat> or holy ones. It's from there that Greek word where we get words like sanctuary. Sanctuary means the holy place. In Latin, the uh, word was sanctus. We heard that. <clears throat> sanctus. It's from that sanctus we get sanctuary. Um, why do we in uh, in Christian weddings we say we are gathered together for this holy matrimonial? For each other, exactly right. Right, so the bride is saying, of all the men that I can have in the world, I'm setting myself apart for you. The groom is saying, of all the women that I can have in the world, my eyes are only for you. Holiness, being set apart, right? They are set apart for each other, <clears throat> not for, set apart for the sake of being set apart. Okay, so holiness, God's glory and beauty. <clears throat> Exodus 28, verse 2. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall make holy garments um, for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So we get a sense of what holiness is. God wants holy garments for the priest. For what purpose? To display glory and beauty. Psalm 29, verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. Psalm 96, verse 9, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of, his, of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Okay, the, the words there are for glory and beauty. Okay, give unto the Lord glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So, let's go through those notes. I'm going through these notes. I hope you understand because uh, these words are just put so well together. It's uh, I, I I couldn't do justice to it. So and so, just follow along with me, okay? The hand of the Lord is a metaphor for God's omnipotence, strength, and power. The eye of the Lord is a metaphor for God's omniscience, His all-knowing. The ear of the Lord, referring to His ear hearing our prayer. The face of the Lord referring to his presence, and also to his disposition towards a certain matter. The, the feet of the Lord, or his footstool, is a metaphor for God's dwelling place and the place of his dominion. The mind of the Lord is a metaphor for God's thoughts, God's wisdom, on a certain matter. Wow. So what is interesting is that we see holiness associated with beauty. and The beauty of God is called holiness so that means it can be translated worship the lord in the holiness of his holiness that's what it says no the holiness the beauty of god is called holiness so <laughs> holiness is god revealing and expressing his beauty his glory his splendor his grandeur his magnificence his perfection his excellence 
We cannot stand in the presence of the Holy One and not go back unchanged. Like, you know, Superman's, he gets his strength from the sun. If you know anything about Superman, you know, but the, one of the reasons why he's strong is different from every other human being is that uh, it's not just because he's an alien, um, the comics case, okay, so the Earth's, Earth's sun is younger and so his cells have nourished and it, it gains, and so because of that, he has super strength. And so he's in the presence of a sun and because of which he's changed, he's not the same, he's very different, isn't it? So being in the atmosphere or an environment of something supernatural, like to be in the presence of God, to stand before him and to think that nothing's going to happen to you is uh, not wise. Right? Something is going to happen to us when we are in his presence. We are exposed to his atmosphere. We are exposed to this being. And something's bound to happen. And that's why chains break when he shows up. Right? That's why bondages, that's why people are set free. That's why addictions are broken. They are all a result of his presence. Are you with me, right? Yes? No? Maybe? Okay. Thank you. So, let's come down to the very last page of this chapter. Um, actually, the holiness and goodness of God, the last second. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? forbearance and long suffering not knowing that he that the good, goodness of god leads you to repentance romans 11 verse 21 and 22 it says for if god did not spare the natural branches he may not spare you either therefore consider the goodness and severity of god and those who fell severity but toward you goodness if you continue his goodness otherwise you will also be cut off So there's a parallel that's being drawn here in these scriptures between the holiness and the goodness of God. The holiness of God banishes sins as no unclean thing can gain favor in his sight. The goodness and mercy of God woos the sinner, draws the sinner to himself. Okay, The goodness and the mercy of God draws the sinner to himself. Where God's grace endows the sinner with righteousness and holiness, making the sinner a saint, fully fit to stand in the presence of the Holy One. He is our righteousness. Right? Um, I'll stop here. We can, we can kind of stop here. There are a lot of scriptures uh, in the last page of this chapter, talks from Genesis 28 to 17. Uh, where it says, Jacob woke up from a dream where he heard God speak to him and his response was, how awesome. The word awesome simply means dreadful, terror actually. Strikes terror. So how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. We looked at this verse in the last semester. The first place, first time where the house of God is mentioned or the church <laughs> as we call it. Um, Exodus 3, um, all the familiar passages, Moses' encounters, Joshua's encounters, Joshua chapter 5. Um, you know, for the longest time, my prayer was, my prayer still is, is I want to see what Isaiah saw. I want to see what Ezekiel saw. Ezekiel chapter 1 is considered um, to be one of those chapters that is so hard to explain even by the scribes if you come to the office library there's this book the hebrew bible called the tanakh it's the compilation of the old testament uh and so there's like the literal translation and the notes there uh, i went to ezekiel chapter one to see what notes has been given there it's the scribes of those days found it very difficult to put it in words of what the vision of ezekiel in the chapter one is it's it's uh, incredible you should read it if you haven't already it talks about the cherubims in this place. Isaiah sees the seraphim, and there are these other super angels that uh, Ezekiel sees. 
uh, these beings had four faces, right? A face of a man, face of an eagle, face of a lion, and a face of an ox. All of that represents something, okay? And they went back and forth uh, like lightning. That means they were traveling in the speed of lightning. Like It's not quite the speed of light, but they're traveling pretty fast. It's there in Ezekiel 1. I'm not making it up, okay? It's not some science fiction book. It's not some mythical thing. This is, uh, you know, this is happening. You know, uh, imagine with me for one moment as we close. Um, again, forgive me if I'm repeating this. Uh, imagine comes from the word image. Yes or no? Um, now, if you've seen a horror movie, uh, whatever horror movie, um, and then you get scared to sleep in the night alone, or if you get scared to go into the dark room alone, why? Because the images of that movie is running in your head. So because of those images, you're imagining. Yes or no? Right? And so image, imagine, leads to imagination, nation of images. <laughs> Okay, and the word magic comes from the same word image. Actually, image comes from <laughs> magic, magi. Magi from the East came. Same word. Magic, magi, image, Im imagine, imagine, imagination. And so images, this whole book is full of images of God for us so that we can meditate and imagine. Imagination is one of the most powerful gifts that God has given to us, right? So imagine a lion in heaven roaring holy. I want to go to heaven. I want to be in this thing. And they're like, OK, yeah, <laughs> you know? Wow, just 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 imagine this God that we and I are worshiping is is beyond something that can be put in words. We know that. <laughs> um, he is indescribable. We, he is nothing like we've ever met or seen or heard. He is holy. All of heaven know that. All of heaven knows that. He is holy. There is no one like him. It, yeah, he's, he's just, you know, seated on the throne, surrounded with the royal diadem of heaven, surrounded with the sea of glass. He sits enthroned. He is holy. Seraphims above his throne, cherubims below, surrounded with the living creatures in Revelation 4. His throne room is magnificent <laughs> because he is there. The king of glory is there. And we need to burn, and our hearts need, uh, really need to, uh, not just intellectually, uh, you know, as we mentioned, but we should want to know him for who he is. There's this uh, book called uh, by John Paul Jackson. It's called Seven Days Behind the Veil. If you can get your hands on it, you should. Seven Days Behind the Veil. Um, it talks about he talks about his encounters. Um, but anyways, okay. Um, so I hope there was something that you could take away from today's class, and uh, we will continue with this next week. All right. Thank you all for joining. God bless you. Have a lovely rest of the day.